said, I welcome everyone to our leadership development tonight in Jesus' name. I believe we're developing. I am developing. And the Lord will confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. So happy to have you here. And I pray that your work will not be in vain in Jesus' name. It will bless the work of your hand. Bless the ministry in your hand. It will reward you here on earth and also in eternity in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our leadership development tonight. Thank you for your people. Happy, cheerful, ready to learn. We're asking, O oh Lord, your word will influence everyone positively in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. As you know, we've been going through a series of studies on leadership. And tonight we come to the letter P. The subject tonight is pastoring with a shepherd's heart in leadership. Pastoring with a shepherd's heart in leadership. In Jeremiah chapter 3, reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. As we think about the pastoral ministry, it's a ministry God himself is interested in, and he himself is in charge. He has not delegated it to an angel. He has not delegated it to any man. He himself said, I will give you pastors. Not just one pastor, but pastors. Talking to the whole nation. And he says the pastors he will give them will be men, women, after his own heart. That tells us then, it's not just only David in the nation. That he said, I have found a man after my own heart. He says, yes, I found David and I found others, but I'm going to also send others. And I will give you pastors in the plural according to my heart, which shall feed you. It tells us that a pastor is not just a position holder. It's not just somebody sitting down the seat of leadership, on the seat of authority. He will do something. He will feed the people with knowledge. Obviously then, he himself will not be ignorant. How can an ignorant person feed the nation and feed the people of God with knowledge? And then it says with understanding. What's the difference between knowledge and understanding? The knowledge is the raw material we have. The understanding is how to so manage that knowledge and apply it to our lives and apply it to the lives of the people we're talking to. They have knowledge, they have doctrine, they have the truth, they have the basic uh, thin raw material. Now they know how to apply that in their lives and they have understanding, the understanding to live and the understanding to be what they ought to be. Look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied. The ministry of the pastor causes multiplication and increased in the land. The ministry of the pastor causes increase. He feeds with knowledge. The people that have knowledge, they have understanding. From that understanding, they go out and they stretch forth the light and they beam forth the light of knowledge in the lives of other people. And so, they're able to bring other people to the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the Redeemer, the knowledge of the Savior, the knowledge of holiness and godliness, and they multiply. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, says the Lord, that 
they shall no more uh, see the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they beseech it, neither shall that be done anymore. And at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. You see the ministry of the pastor, it brings God to reign without a rival in the hearts of people. We're not just like, you know, we're just there, we're warming the bench, we're sitting on seat of authority, and we hold title and position. Our ministry as pastors will make even the whole church, the Jerusalem, the city of God, the throne of God, and all nations shall be gathered unto it. That means the light will be shining from the center. And nations around will see, and they'll be gathered unto it. And it says, they'll be uh, for the name to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. The ministry of the pastor changes hearts, transforms hearts, so that the people you hear, they apply the word to their lives. They come to the Lord. Their lives are transformed. And now they are no more walking after the imagination of their husband. Verse 18, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. House of Judah, this side, out of, out of his house of Israel, this side, there will be unity. There will be understanding. And then as you conform to the word of God, I conform to the word of God. Everybody conforms to the word of God. There is unity in the truth. There is unity in the knowledge. There is unity in the understanding. There is unity as we serve the Lord and worship the Lord. That the divergence between the house of Israel and the house of Judah, all that divergence is taken away. There's unity and it says, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto, their, unto your fathers. What's that saying? It's saying that the ministry of the pastor will make the people, the members, the people of God, possess their possessions. You see, when you have a real pastor, it shows the people their possession, spiritual possession, and also property and prosperity. They prosper in the soul. They prosper on the land, and they prosper in everything, and they possess their possessions. Let's come to Jeremiah chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 23, the Lord is still talking about the pastors. The pastors he will give to the congregation. The pastors he will give to the people of God. And all these transformations and all these uh, changes and all these um, you know, areas of progress will happen in their personal lives, in their family lives, in their ministerial lives, and in everything they do for the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 23, we're reading from verse 3. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their fulls, and they shall be fruitful and increase. It's saying that as pastors, if we pastor with the shepherd's heart, if we pastor and according to the mind and the heart of the chief shepherd, it says he'll bring the people that have been driven away, he'll bring them to their foes. He'll bring them under the same authority of a chief shepherd, of a lord, of a master, of a redeemer. And he says everyone will be fruitful. Look at verse 4. And I will set up, always remember, is the prerogative of God himself. 
and it is the duty of the Lord himself. It is what he is to do, and nobody can do this or take it away from him. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. Look at that again. It's saying, when he sets up the shepherds, the pastors over them, those pastors, they will know the singular reason, the major reason, the major reason and the foremost reason when they are set over the people is to feed the people and they shall fear no more. They will not have their usual fear. They will not have the common fears. They will not have even the sudden fear anymore because they are so taught. And the knowledge they have, the entrance of the word of the knowledge will bring light. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so they will not fear, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. There will be no lack in the hearts and the minds and the families of the people when we shepherd properly, when we pastor properly. But you know something, you know, after we have um, a pastor for a few years, maybe for five years, maybe for seven years, maybe for ten years or more, naturally, pastors sometimes get tired. Like Moses got tired. Like Elijah got tired. What helps a pastor that God has set upon his own fold, upon his own flock, upon his own congregation, when he gets tired like that, and he's, he gives, he's almost giving up like Moses, saying, have I begotten these people? I'm tired. I cannot lead them. Sometimes when you get tired, how is it you're still able to move on? We're coming to Jeremiah chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him. I'm tired. I can't evangelize. I'm tired. I can't feed the people. I not even make mention of his name anymore, nor speak anymore in his name. But even though I felt like that, I felt it's time to rest. It's time to withdraw. It's time to give up. And I don't think I want to pursue this anymore, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire. You know, sometimes you look at pastors, the still pastors, the seed holding the position, they're tired, they're worn out, they're weary. But if they are going to get up again, if revival, if renewal, if uh, the fire is going to burn again, the words they have heard and the words we're hearing from week to week will be in our heart like fire. It says the word was in my heart like fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. I could not withdraw again and I still have to do it. That word will be like fire in your bones in Jesus' name. If you allow the word to always come in, if you allow the word to always have its place in your heart, it will burn like fire. I said it will burn like fire. And then you will rise up in the strength of the Lord. Weariness will vanish away in Jesus' name. Tiredness will vanish away in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Jeremiah chapter 23, and I'm reading from verse 29. Jeremiah 23 verse 29, Is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? When the word is in our heart, it's like fire. And even though you wanted to retreat, you wanted to reverse, you wanted to just stay aside, and you're tired, you don't want to do anything again, the word will fire you up. When did Jeremiah get that word that became like fire inside him? 
And then he said, I could not stay. I needed to go on. I had to go on preaching the word. Jeremiah chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. And says the Lord, verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And he never forgot that word. He stayed with that word. He held on to that word. And he said, The word is like fire in my heart, shut up in my bones. And so I could not stay. And somebody is saying, I wish the Lord will do that to me. And the Lord will put the word in my mouth and then in my heart it will be like fire so that when i'm getting weary and getting tired that fire will burn and then i will move on that's exactly what he has promised to do in jeremiah chapter 33 jeremiah chapter 31 rather in jeremiah chapter 31 i'm reading from verse 33 but this is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. You see that? I'll put my word in their inward parts. I will write that word in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I pray that promise will be fulfilled in every one of our lives, brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. Somebody shouted, Amen. Amen. Pastoring with a shepherd's heart in leadership. We're looking at the message under three subtitles. Number one, the marks of commissioned pastors in leadership. How do we recognize them? What are their marks? What are their qualifications? If you are a pastor like that, commissioned by the Lord, and he has put you into leadership, what marks are we looking for in your life? The marks of commissioned pastors in leadership. Point number two, the ministry of competent preachers to the lost. There must be something we're doing to the lost. Or the sheep I have that are not of this fold, them I must bring. He wants to use us for the lost to bring on, to bring in those people who are outside. Number two, the ministry of competent preachers to the lost. Point number three now, the model of confirmed pattern in the Lord. What model can we follow? Confirmed as a pattern by the Lord himself. And then we follow that model and we are confirmed and competent, commissioned pastors and preachers of the Lord. We'll come to point number one. The marks, the qualifications of commissioned pastors in leadership. As we look at uh, these uh, marks, you're uh, looking at your own personal life. How are you demonstrating that you have these marks and these qualifications in uh, pastoral leadership? Exodus chapter 18. In Exodus chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 19. Exodus chapter 18, verse 19. Behold now, hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. When you are a pastor, like Moses was a pastor, a shepherd over the children of Israel, yes, we have counsel, 
we have advice we have you know some people that have good intention they can talk to us we must be approachable we must be reachable we must be accessible but then we must also understand god has put us there and god shall be with thee they will not drive a new opinion down our throat without our checking off from the Lord. They will not impose any personality upon us or impose any idea upon us as if they are the people that put us there as the pastor. God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God watch that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. The pastor is not a lone ranger, is not a uh, brother know it all, sister do it all. But she has other people, he has other people, and then he will tell them what to do, and he will show them the way they will walk. It tells us, moreover, in verse 21, thou shalt provide of all the people. Don't go and bring in strangers who are not born again. Don't go, don't go and bring in sinners who do not know the way of the Lord. And don't choose out of the mixed multitudes who do not have the experience of the children of God. Among all the people, out of all the people, evil men such as fear God. That's the qualification. Such as fear God. Men of truth, those who are truthful. And those who are sold to the truth, hating covetousness. They do not have the love of money, which is the root of all evil, and place such over them to be rulers over thousands, and rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. It's saying that those pastors that are chosen and the marks we look for, they might have ability to reach only tens of people, like 30, 3 tens, like 40, 4 tens, like 50, 5 tens. Or they might have uh, the ability to rule over and to lead and to feed 50s, 250s, making a 100, 350s, making a 150, or 450s, making 200. Or they might have the ability to uh, rule and lead over hundreds, that is uh, 200 or 300. Or they might have the ability to reach and to teach thousands, 2,000, and so on. In verse 22, and let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be as that every great matter they shall bring unto thee but every small matter every regular matter every simple matter they shall judge then it says so shall it be easier for thyself and thou shalt bear the body in they shall bear the body with thee look at this now if thou shalt do this sin and God command thee so. The man did not say, I'm your father-in-law. I'm older than you are. I have more experience than you have. Whatever you claim to be your spiritual calling or commission, this is me talking to you. You must do it. When we talk to pastors, we must give the allowance. This is what we think. This is what we feel. But we cannot compel you if God command thee so. We must still give the final authority and the final say to the hands of God. If thou shalt do this sin and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. And all these people shall also go to their place in peace. The Lord grant us the heart of obedience in Jesus' name. Let the people of God say, Amen. We're coming to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 
and we're reading from verse 2. Second Samuel chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 2. In verse 2 here is uh, what we learn about pastoral leadership. It says in chapter 23 and verse 2, the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. We're not picking our message from the street. We're not picking our messages from hearsay. We're not picking a message from, you know, what people are telling us and putting in our mouth. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and the word, His word, was in my tongue. That's the qualification, the mark, a real pastor, a real shepherd should have. The word of the Lord, not opinions of men, the word of the Lord must be in our mouth. We're coming to Second Chronicles, and we're reading from chapter 19. Second Chronicles, chapter 19. We're reading here from verse 4. In Second Chronicles chapter 19, reading from verse 4, And Joshua dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought, back, brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. You know what had happened? Joshua had misled the people. He didn't ask God. He didn't lead by God's voice, God's word. He have said, will you go with me to battle? Oh, he said, my people like your people, and I'm like you are. Let's go together. And then eventually he came back from that war. That's evil association, corrupting good manners. That's unequal yoke that God himself hates. When he came back, the Lord sent a prophet to say, the Lord is not happy with you. And you have led the people of God astray as a pastor. He didn't just say, okay, privately, God, forgive me. Well, God will forgive, but how about the people you led astray? Are the people, how about the people you misled? He went from place to place and he brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. That's genuine repentance. That's restitution. You led people astray. They are following your wrong attitude. They are following your wrong action. And they followed you to battle with Ahab. Now you bring them back. I pray God will give us the humility and the conviction to do that in Jesus' name. Somebody give me a good amen now. You know, it still happens today. They'll say, preacher, not in our country here, in a neighboring country, who had been misleading the people for a long time. And he will go over the radio and he will preach to the people and say, you know, they were always, some people are saying one man, one wife, but, uh, you know, the Lord permits you, gives you the liberty. Uh, second wife or third wife, whatever, grace is what's important. And he was saying that over the radio. Then he said, restitution, what's restitution? Grace and the blood of Jesus covers it all. But one day, as he was reading the Bible, and the Spirit of God spoke to him, the Lord said, you know you are wrong. You know you are preaching against the very word of the Lord. He repented privately. He prayed to the Lord privately, but he did something. He came over the radio. And then he preached over the radio. He said, today, I'm not preaching, you know, something like you've heard before. I want to tell you I am wrong. I want to tell you I've been saying, I've even, you know, led other people who have married before. I've done second marriage for them. And I want to tell all those people, I am sorry, I am wrong. And I want to tell all the radio uh, listeners, I am wrong in that. And then about restitution, he corrected everything over the radio. And not, uh, you know, many months or years after that, he passed on to glory. 
the Lord knew he was soon to come home and he wanted to make his way right before he went home. And that's what happened to Joseph. He went around and over all those people, he corrected the wrong step he had taken. That's a real pastor. I pray God will give us humility to make a change where we have been wrong before in Jesus' name. And he said in verse 5, he sent judges in the land throughout all the fair cities of Judah, city by city. He didn't say, once the headquarters is all right, that's okay. He knew he was responsible as the overall leader in the nation that God put there in all the cities of Judah. He appointed the overseers, he appointed the leaders, he appointed the judges, and he said to the judges, Take it what ye do. For ye judge not for man, but for the Lord. How the pastor should realize you're not preaching for man. And you are not ministering for man. You are ministering to men, but you are doing it on behalf of the Almighty God. It says, but for God, who is with you in the judgment? Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take it and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. For no, no respect of persons, nor the taking of gifts. Moreover, in Jerusalem, the, the Je Jehoshaphat said of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for judgment uh, of, the, of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem and he charged them saying thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord that's what a pastor should tell the workers under his leadership that's what the pastor should tell all the members in his local assembly everything you do in your office everything you do in the public Everything you do in the in privacy, you do everything in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. We're coming to Ezra chapter 7, the marks of commissioned pastors in leadership. In Ezra chapter 7, I read from verse 10. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. It's not a man that will say, do as I say and not as I do. He knew that his first responsibility is to seek the word of the Lord and to have the grace of God and to have the Christian experience that's in our own, in our own time now that will make him obedient to the word of God. And so Ezra by prayer, Ezra, by consecration, Ezra, by commitment, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. And to do it. A, a pastor will look at the word of God for his personal life and he will match his life with the word of God to do it. He will look at the family life, relationship between husband and wife, and he will say, here is what the word of God says, I must be a pattern, my family must be a pattern, and to do it, he would look at his own relationship with other people, interaction with other people. If he happens to be a businessman, and if he happens to be somebody who has uh, borrowed money, and then he's supposed to pay back, he would look at the word of God and do it. And if there is any kind of disagreement between him and another person, he will not say, I am pastor. And so if the fellow does not bow down to me, well, he is the one that will suffer for it. He will take the path of lowliness and meekness and humility and read the word of God and do it. That's the mark of a real pastor and the mark of a real leader. 
And if there is any backsliding, if there is any failure in the spiritual life, as he expects that the people, the members of the church, will report to him whenever something goes wrong and they will correct that thing, he too, he will, he will repent and he will inform the pastor over him. If it's a district pastor, he will inform the group pastor and then he will write to the senior pastor in that uh, locality, in that city. If it's um, a district pastor, he will tell the region of Asia. A region of Asia, if it happens to him, he'll tell the state of Asia. If it's a state of Asia, he has to get, him, uh, get uh, in touch with the general superintendent so that with the line of humility and the line of repentance and the line of restitution will continue. He will seek the law of the Lord and do it. And to teach is only after that he has a right to teach. He's obeying the word of God. He's carrying out the word of God. And as a result of that, he has a clear conscience that he is obedient to the word of the Lord. And now he will teach in Israel the statutes and the judgments. Look at verse 23 of that same chapter. Verse 23, whatsoever is commanded by God. God, by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. He said, this is the king now talking to Ezra, and he's saying, whatever the Lord has commanded, the God of heaven, you cannot change on earth what the God of heaven has commanded, and what he has commissioned. Whatever he has commanded from heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? Verse 25, And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, not the wisdom of the world, they are worldly wise people, they are wise like the politicians to lie, to deceive and they are wise like the people of the world and that's the wisdom of Satan but this is the wisdom of God the mark of a true pastor the mark of a true leader the mark of one appointed by God commissioned by God and put into leadership the mark is that he will pray he will have the wisdom of God it says and thou Ezra after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, such magistrates and judges which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God. The people you appoint will not be ignorant people will not be people that you know you are friendly with and you just choose them because of friendship they will be people that know the word of god and teach them that know them not that's what the lord is telling us that if we are going to be pastors and shepherds appointed after god's own heart will be obedient to the word of god the grace of god will be in our lives and the experience of salvation will be definite and real and the experience of holiness without without which no one shall say the lord will be definite will be real the people will know that as far as they can tell the pastor the preacher the evangelist the leader in the church is righteous and holy the lord confirm it in every life we're coming to first corinthians chapter 4 first corinthians chapter 4 and i'm reading from verses 1 and 2 first corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 let a man so account of us as the ministers of christ so live and so preach and so minister and so act and so behave the people will not have any choice than to say he is a minister of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, 
it is required, is stewards, that a man be found faithful. It is required, is stewards, that a man be found faithful. The Lord keep us faithful. The Lord keep you faithful. Look at First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three. We're reading from verse one. First Timothy chapter three. Reading from verse 1, it tells us from verse 1, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office, the work, the ministry of a bishop, of a pastor, of an overseer, he desireth a good work. And when he gets there, he must do good work. Not bad work, not evil work, not make people of God to backslide, not bring in tradition. Not bring in deception, not bring in evil. When he gets there, he must do good. A bishop then, a pastor then, a shepherd then, an overseer then, must be blameless. You know, there are pastors who say, I don't believe in, uh, you know, holiness. Well, why are you a pastor? I don't believe anybody can be spotless, can be blameless. I don't believe that anybody can be victorious over sin. Oh yeah, pastor, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, the husband of one wife, practically one wife, but, and uh, emotionally just one wife, and in every way just one wife, not one inside, and then one illegal one outside, not one inside, and there's another one that is giving the pleasure that a wife ought to give outside. It must be the husband of one wife. Vigilant. Vigilant. A pastor is not somebody who is uh, driven away from his congregation. He cannot even see the congregation. He's shielded away from the congregation. There is an invisible uh, shield that he cannot touch them. He cannot talk to them. He cannot approach them. No. He must be vigilant. He must be sober of good behavior, giving to hospitality, art to teach. He has the aptitude to teach and the ability to teach, not giving to wine, no striker, and not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the house of God? Not a novice, an ignorant person. Why? Because a pastor will feed the people with knowledge and with understanding. If he is a novice and he is ignorant himself, he cannot have the strength, the ability, the wisdom, the conviction, the backbone to feed the people with knowledge. Not a novice, less being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. What does that mean? Business partners who are not members of the church must have a good report of him. And do so in the market who have the same work with him or with her must have a good report about him, about her. The neighbors who know her, who are outside the fold, they must have a good report. They must know that he lives a life which is doctrinally biblical, a life which is different, a life which is distinct, a life which shines forth the light of Christ above all the people around. He must have a good report of them that are without, lest it fall into the reproach of the, and the snare of the devil. I pray the Lord will have all these in our lives in Jesus' name. Second Timothy, I'm reading from chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, I read from verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone 
everyone that's called a pastor, everyone a preacher, everyone that is called a worker, everyone that nameth the name of Christ departs from iniquity. Verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Prepared unto every good work. Prepared unto every good work. Are you prepared? I want to, I'm asking a question. Are you prepared? You know, there are people, I can only do this. And if the opportunity comes, responsibility comes to do another thing, it says, no, I'm only here for this. This is the only thing I can do. If we are pastors, if we are appointed by the Lord, the qualification qualifies us that we will be able to do any other thing the Lord has appointed. The Lord grant us all the needed grace in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two, the ministry of competent preachers to the lost the ministry is giving us a ministry not only in the local church not only inside the sanctuary and not only in the temple he has given us a ministry outside the local church we're coming to second corinthians chapter 5 second corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 18 and all things are of god who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry has given us. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation to we, that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, that's what we're true. Let the people in the world, the sinners and the lost, that's what we're to let them know that Christ has died for them. That Christ is the final sacrifice. That Christ has now borne their punishment and has taken all the wrath of God away if they will believe, not imputing their trespasses unto them, that as they repent, as they turn away from their sin, and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord will pardon them and will not impute trespasses unto them anymore, and has committed the word unto us, the word of reconciliation. We reconcile God and man. We reconcile a holy God or we reconcile a sinful man with a holy God and we show that Christ is the path to reconciliation and Christ is the price of reconciliation and Christ is the one that has paid the whole price so the sinner now can come out of darkness and come to the light. The sinner can come out of his sin and come unto the Lord. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you, we're begging of you, and we are pleading so that in Christ's head be ye reconciled unto God. That's the ministry he has called us to, but we'll do it in Jesus' name. We're coming to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We're reading from verse 16. Acts 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appointed, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. Think about that. I will give you pastors after mine own heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. God appointed Paul. And Peter could not reverse that. God appointed Paul 
And Christ affirmed that appointment, and Jerusalem could not reverse that, for this purpose have I appeared unto you, to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. That means everything you have seen, that's not the end, the finality of knowledge. I'm still going to appear unto you uh, often, and I'll be showing you the things that you ought to know. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. When God sends us, he'll protect us. He'll preserve us. And whatever those Gentiles are trying to bring out of their pocket, out of their bag, the Lord has known that ahead of time. He will deliver you. He will shield you. He will protect you until you dot every I and cross every T on what you are writing. Your life is secured and safe. Until you preach to the last person and the last lost soul you ought to reach, your life is secured. On the street, your life is secured. In the village, your life is secured. In the church, your life is secured. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God. Hold on. If Paul the Apostle was commissioned to turn the people from the power of Satan unto God, that power of Satan cannot scratch his life. If God has appointed you, to turn people from the power of Satan unto God, the power of Satan to whatever degree and to whatever height cannot scratch your life in Jesus' name. When you are asleep, they cannot even come when you are asleep. There will be a wall of partition between you and those powers of Satan in Jesus' name. You are secured. You are protected. A wall of fire around you in Jesus' name. It says that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Was, was our ministry towards the lost as a competent preacher? Number one, seek the lost. Seek the lost. We're coming to Luke chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 10. Seek the lost. It tells us in verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, there were still a lot of lost people in Jerusalem, in Judah, in Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. He has committed that into our hands now. If I were here, Jesus is saying, I'll seek to save the lost. It's now in your hand. Go and seek the lost. Number two, to open their eyes. The lost are blind. The laws do not know the path they are walking in and the way they are going. And it's the preacher, a competent preacher. And it's the preacher, the commissioned preacher. And it's the, com it's the preacher, the comparing preacher that goes to open their eyes that they are sinners. That they cannot save themselves. That their religion cannot save them. That their personal effort cannot save them. That Christ has come so that what they could not do for themselves, the Lord has now sent you to do that for them. In um, Acts chapter 26 verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18. To open their eyes to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to the light. If the eyes are open and they're still in darkness, they won't see. 
when you open your eyes and you are in deep darkness, you can't see, but you turn to the light. Now you can see, and from the power of Satan unto God, at that day may receive forgiveness of sins. That's what you're opening their eyes to. That anything they do by themselves, all the prayers they pray without going through Jesus Christ cannot bring forgiveness of sin and any inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. Verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. We will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision in Jesus' name. Number three, we're to warn them of the judgment to come. Warn them of judgment to come. We're coming to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man. The people that sin with impunity, and they think, no problem, no judgment. I'll sin and go away with it. They think they have immunity. They can do anything. We're warning them that the judgment of God is running fast after them, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. The Lord will give you the ability to do that effectively in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, the coming judgment will persuade me. To but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. We are persuading men, we are warning men that they will flee from the judgment to come. We persuade, number four, we persuade the ignorant. We persuade the ignorant. The people who are just rushing on in life as if there's no danger, there's no judgment. God has forsaken the earth. He doesn't see anything with you. We are warning them that all the actions of men are reaching down and when they come to the final day of reckoning if they have not repented if they have not received jesus as their personal savior it will be terrible for them they'll come to a point of no return and they'll perish that's why we're warning them let me read that verse 11 again knowing therefore the terror of the lord will persuade men but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Not only that, when they are converted, we keep them as converts. We conserve those converts so that they will not go back into evil, into sin, and into their vomit again. Look at Jude. Only one chapter, Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's what we're telling those converts. Keep yourselves in the love of God. God loves you. And it's the love of God that has brought you in, that now you are saved. You must keep in that love. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. We show them how they are kept, how they can be kept until the final day they read the Bible. They meditate on the word of God. They internalize, apply the word of God to themselves. They pray unto the Lord for grace to live the victorious life. 
and they do that every day, every time, and they take inventory. They are checking up their lives, examine yourselves, whether you stand in the faith. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God and Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Look at the amen of our people. Not only that, number one, you seek the lost. Number two, you open their eyes. Number three, you want them of judgment to come. Number four, you persuade the ignorant. Number five, you keep to conserve the converse. Number six, you lead them to other Christian experiences. Lead them to other Christian experiences. They have repented. They are relying on the Lord. They are born again. How about restitution? How about sanctification? How about Holy Ghost baptism? How about moving on and getting on in the Lord? How about growing in grace in First Thessalonians chapter 3? First Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Reading from verse 10. It says in verse 10, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You already believe, but Paul as a pastor, Paul as a preacher, Paul as an apostle, he wanted to see them, get to them. Not just to socialize, not to entertain, not to say, how are you there? To perfect what is lacking in their faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another to increase must make progress in a christian experience and toward all men even as we do toward you to the end for the purpose he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness unblameable in holiness they were saved he wanted them to move forward get sanctified and become so holy, you are unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He wanted to be sure they were ready to meet the Lord when he would come. Number seven, to make them productive. Make them productive. And I say, Racine, we are at those uh, converts and we're discipling them so that they'll not remain babes all their lives. So, want them to become productive in the Lord. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 2 And the things which thou hast heard of me. Among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul had raised up Titus and Timothy, Epaphras, Epaphroditus, and all those other people. And I was telling Timothy, you are produced and you are trained and you are brought up, you are developed. Do that for other people too. The things you have heard of me, the things you have learned from me, the things you have observed from me, you commit to other witnesses, many other witnesses, faithful men, faithful preachers, who shall be able to teach others also. The Lord help us, we will not be barren in the ministry in Jesus' name. I will not be barren. You'll not be barren in Jesus' name. You reproduce, reproduce. How are we going to do that? Point number three, the model of confirmed pattern 
in the Lord. The model of confirmed pattern in the Lord. As we look at the model, number one, we're going to look at the model of Paul the Apostle. Look at First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 16. First Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul the Apostle said, I'm not just an isolated preacher, isolated pastor, isolated apostle, isolated leader, and then I'm not so strong that other people cannot be like me. He said, in fact, the Lord has raised me up as a pattern that other people will follow after my pattern and they'll say if the grace of God is available for Paul the apostle that grace is available for me too and I can be a pattern you will follow after that pattern in Jesus name look at first Corinthians chapter 4 first Corinthians chapter 4 we're reading from verse uh, reading from verse 16 First Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 16. Paul the Apostle, a pattern. You too will be a pattern. Look at verse 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. If Paul had a special grace that nobody else can have, he cannot say, be ye followers of me. If Paul was a special apostle, and he was uh, constructed and, and created to be a special apostle, we cannot copy a person like that. But he says, the grace I have is available to everyone. And he says, I beseech you therefore, be ye followers of me. The Lord has made him a pattern You'll be like that in Jesus' name. Chapter, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I am reading from verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. He said, you know, I live my life. I'm not always the time claiming my right. I'm not always the time wanting to impose this on other people. I lower myself. I humble myself so that people, as many people as possible, will be saved. That's the pattern he wants us to follow, to deny yourself. To look away from the things that please you and to see how to get to other people so that they will be saved. First Corinthians chapter 9. In First Corinthians chapter 9, it says from verse 20, it says unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. And I, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. And to them that are without the law as without the law. Be not without law to God but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak. That I might gain the weak, I am made all things to all men, that I by all means might save some. He said, that's the kind of pattern I am. I do everything that souls will be saved. I do everything that will have the opportunity. The people who are not saved, the people who have not known the Lord, will have somebody coming to them. And I will get to them and make sure that the word of salvation and the word of regeneration and the word of reconciliation with God gets to them before they pass on to the great beyond. First Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even or as also 
as I am of Christ. It says, I take Christ as my pattern, and then I follow him, and I'm asking you too, I've got the grace to follow. You too can have the grace to follow. Be ye followers of me, as I am also follower of Christ. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Here is another pattern. Here was a disciple of the Lord, but raised up by Paul the Apostle. And Titus had grace, and the same grace available, because uh, Titus was to be a pattern to in Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Not only Paul the Apostle, even Titus, in all things, all things at home, all things in church, all things in ministry, all things on the pulpit, all things your place of work, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of contrary of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil to say of you i pray that as the lord made paul and he made titus a pattern he'll make every one of us a good pattern as well in jesus name titus chapter one look at verse nine verse nine Holding forth the word, the faithful word, as he has been taught, that he by, be, may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That's what they did as patterns, and that is what God is expecting of you, of everyone, so that we hold forth that faithful word as we have been taught. Chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You are imagining, speak the things that uh, that shall be fit, become sound doctrine. You are counseling, you are sharing, you are interacting with another person, a man interacting with a woman, a woman interacting with a man. You will not say things that cannot see the light of day. Well, hear this, but don't tell any other person. This between you and I, the sin, the sinful. Speak thou the things that become sound doctrine and i pray that the lord will give us uh, that uh, heart and that lifestyle in jesus name verse 15 of that chapter 2 these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority let no man despise thee when he says, uh, let no man despise you, it doesn't mean carry a cudgel and carry his cheek. And if anybody will despise you, then you whack them and say, don't do that to me. No, he's saying, comport your life. Behave yourself. Live your life in such a way that you will earn self-respect so that people will not look down on you because of the life above reproach that you are living. Look at chapter 3, Titus chapter 3. We're reading from verse 1. But put them in mind to be subject unto principalities and powers, to be magistrates, to be ready for every to every good work. Don't uh, make members of your church, members of your local assembly, uh, to be unruly and to create a civil disobedience. Let them be ready for every good work. And then uh, you're obedient to the truth. And you take the truth, and people can see that you abide in the truth. I will abide. I will abide in Jesus' name. We are looking at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow 
of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that thou make all things, make all things, make all things according to the pattern should be in the mount. Here is our own mount of transfiguration. We hear the word of God. We receive the word of God. As we go to our various posts of duty and we go to the pulpit of ministry, we make sure that we do all things according to the pattern that is shown unto us. Now, in conclusion, as we look at everything we'll be studying on leadership, as we look at everything the Lord has been revealing unto us, that this is the pattern we ought to follow, what can we take home? And what can we take with us and say, I know that's the pattern, I know that's the way, I know that's the word, I know that's the model. This is what the Lord is telling us, A, accept his appointed assignment. You have to accept it first. If you don't accept it, are you going to carry it out? If you say, no, I'm greater than that, I am more than that, I cannot do that now, a, accept his appointed assignment. B, burn the bridge behind. So that you'll not look back. You'll not be saying, I think I would have liked to do this. I would have liked to go there. I would have liked to do the other thing. Burn the bridge behind. C, cultivate the courage of champions. If you're going to do the work of God and do it effectively, you cannot be like a pygmy. You cannot be like a grasshopper. You cannot be like somebody who is looking down and you cannot look up and stand like a champion. Cultivate the courage of champions. D, deliberately deny daily delinquencies. You know, uh, some careless uh, things will try to come and make you like you are cheap and make you like you don't have any backbone. Deliberately deny daily delinquencies. E, exemplify excellence everywhere. Exemplify excellence everywhere. When you set your mind to do anything, you tell yourself, in this I must excel. Anything you do, anywhere, ex exemplify excellence everywhere. Ab, face the future or face fortitude and focus. Face the future. There is a future. Face that future. And face that future with faith, with fortitude, with focus. G, God is glory with grace and godliness. The glory of God is at stake. There are many people that are blaspheming the name of the Lord and they're putting the glory of God in the mud. You are raised up to gird, to protect. Gird his glory with grace and godliness. H, heal yourself of hearts that hold you back. Hearts that hold you back. You know, in the congregation, there might have been something that have happened. There are many people in the congregation. There are sinners in the congregation. There are backsliders in the congregation. There are babes in the congregation. There are unintelligent people in the congregation. There are people that even have mental challenge in the congregation. And many things happen. You cannot leave the pulpit and go and ask them, do you have mental problem? Do you have backsliding problem? Do you have this? Do you have that? And therefore, whatever you see, don't allow that to hurt you. Heal yourself of hearts that hold you back. I ignore inevitable impediments. There are, you know, people that put things on the way that you stumble over. Impediments are always there. The world has a devil. The world has a Satan. The world has demons. The world has people that are following him and they put impediment there, impediment there, impediment there inevitable ignore them and move on ignore inevitable impediments j joyfully journey on like the just you have been justified 
you have been saved and you don't have any guilt joyfully happily nobody determines your joy you determine your joy and as you journey on in ministry and you journey on in the assignment god has given you joyfully journey on like the jaws okay keep your eyes on the king and his kingdom the kingdom come keep your eyes on that kingdom he has translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son keep your eyes on the king and the kingdom and then el labor on in love don't ever labor in hatred don't ever labor in bitterness labor on in love em move the mountain or the mountain mover if you cannot move the mountain face the mountain mover that's god himself and move the hand that holds the universe move the mountain or move the mountain mover and neutralize the negative in his name negative things that happen neutralize them in his name he has given us the name and he said whatsoever we ask in that name he will give unto us neutralize the negative in his name oh obtain enough oil for your oppression the oil of gladness the oil that will take every friction away obtain enough oil for your oppression and the P pursue the prospects with prayer, with patience, with perseverance. The prospects, the people who are giving to you, watch over them and bring them to the kingdom of God. Move on and pursue those prospects by prayer, by patience, and by perseverance. Q, qualify yourself to quiet in the questioners there are people who are always asking questions who are always asking questions whether the question is reasonable or not and they are always there qualify yourself to quiet in them don't be afraid and don't fear them don't be frightened intimidated by by them qualify yourself to quiet in the questioners and are refreshed and recover for reproduction refresh yourself before you go for ministry and before you go to minister you refresh yourself with prayer you refresh yourself with the word of god you refresh yourself with the promises of god you refresh your mind you refresh your soul you refresh your intellect you refresh your inner man and you recover all the strength you ever got for reproduction as serve the saints for their sanctification you're serving the saints so that they'll come out of self they'll come out of whatever might be holding them back make them saints by your ministry serve the saints for their sanctification teach the truth for transformation you're not just teaching the truth to stop their head with knowledge you want them to be transformed that's why you are called a pastor that's why you are called a preacher you teach the truth for transformation you urge the upright to more usefulness they are upright they know the lord urge them inspire them move them on stir them up urge their upright for the more usefulness v is to view and visualize the vision often the vision you got like paul the apostle at the beginning of his calling and he said i was not disobedient to the heavenly calling he viewed that vision every time visualized the vision every time that's why he remained alive and that's why he remains progressive always moving on double years to walk by his word as a worthy watchman you are walking in his word you are walking by his word as a worthy watchman x is to x-ray for exploits x-ray for exploits it's like you know before you come in into the field of battle you x-ray yourself in the word of god by the spirit of god is there anything hidden there in my personality that is not good it's not right for exploits and as you x-ray yourself for exploits anything that will hinder great exploits in your ministry they are taken away in jesus name why is to yearn 
all year long for greater yield. Yen, all year long for greater yield. There are people, when they hear of Vision 2020, where they heard, that's where they leave it. But you pick up that vision and you yearn. This is what the Lord has promised for this year. And then for years after, and you are yearning for that, yearning for that, all year long for greater yield, Z is to zero in on the zenith. Nothing else concerns you. I'm going to the top. Nothing else bothers you. I want the very zenith. And you zero in, you focus on. It's like you search your camera lens and you're looking at that zenith, the highest point, and we're getting there. We're getting to the peak of the mountain. I am going to the peak of the mountain. And you go through all this on your knees when you get back home and you say, Lord, this must be the picture of me as a pastor, as a preacher, as a pilgrim, as somebody who is moving on and getting to the peak. You'll be there in Jesus' name. The grace of God abide in your life. The Spirit of God abides in your life. The fire of the Holy Ghost be in your heart, in your mind, in your bones, in Jesus' name. And that fire always keep you awake, moving on without ever turning back in Jesus' name. I see you there. I said, I see you there. Tell the Lord, rise up now and let there be a confirmation in your life. I will be there. I will be there. I will be there. I'll pastor with a shepherd's heart in leadership.